okay uh, so welcome back uh, today we are going to talk about randomized function approximator so just to remind you of what we are trying to do uh, we have a set of data points we have a set of data points x i z i i equals 1 to m we want to feed this data into a regression algorithm and we want to get a, a function f hat which uh, defines the relationship between xi and zi. In particular, we want the f hat to satisfy that f hat xi is approximately equal to zi. Okay, so today what we are going to do is so so far what we have talked about is a class of uh, deterministic regression algorithms where uh, the randomization only comes from the data set itself and not from the algorithm which is doing the regression. Okay, so today what we are going to talk about is uh, how can we make this block, uh, how can we use randomization within this block in order to improve the uh, uh, overall performance of the function approximation as well as uh, to reduce the computational complexity that is associated with all the optimization algorithms you need to run uh, while doing the regression. So there are two essential ideas in this uh, uh, lecture which is um, a large number of weak learners uh, which means a committee is better than uh, a one strong learner okay so there shouldn't be s here so a large so a committee is better than a strong learner and you can think of it uh, if if I could use a movie analog a analogy uh, 12 angry men is better than the dictator okay um, we'll see how this uh, uh, well we won't see it uh, numerically but uh, we are going to talk about the theoretical part but if you look at some of the books written in machine learning on these ideas then you will find that uh, they have uh, these ideas have really outperformed uh, so the committee has really outperformed strong learner in many cases many many situations and the second idea is uh, how do you come up with weak learners so the second idea is basically saying that well random functions uh, a large number of random functions can be added with appropriate weights to yield a reasonably good function approximator with high probability so that's the that's the key here um, okay so if you want probability one result you have to do deterministic optimization but if you want high probability results you can perhaps use random functions uh, to uh, reduce the computational burden. Now, of course, uh, uh, you know, in, in practice, uh, whenever you have results with high probability, they just tend to do very well in practice because, you know, in practice, uh, the worst case scenario rarely happens. So the first idea that we are going to talk about, so that the, the, the two ideas that we will talk about is bootstrapping and bagging and the second idea we are going to talk about is boosting okay and then based on this we will move on to the third idea which is random functions and random forest okay so let's move on to bootstrapping what is the uh, bootstrapping so remember that you have a data set uh, xi zi i equals 1 to m you feed it to a regression algorithm and what you get is an f hat uh, which is a function from x to z uh, the space z okay now you want to so remember that this f hat is a random function it's a random function but the randomness actually comes from the data due to data okay so because the data may be coming from a iid distribution or from some other randomized process uh, and that's why um, uh, your f hat becomes a random function so we would like to study the statistical properties of the random function f hat okay so that's the essential idea that's the essential motivation for doing bootstrapping but then it leads to a very cool algorithm called bagging okay so what is the bootstrapping idea says so well i have I want to study the statistical properties of f hat if I only have one data set there is no way 
I can find uh, statistical properties of f hat because it requires me to have a lot of data points about f hat. So what you do is you sort of uh, um, you replace this data set, one data set, with a lot of different data sets. So what you do is you have this, let's say, data set with one million points. You split it using some IID sampling technique into a data set of 10 raised to 4 elements and then another data set of 10 raised to 4 elements and so on. Okay, you can, I'm just giving some numbers 10 raised to 6 and 10 raised to 4. You can do whatever you want, how much soever points you want. Okay, and then you run the regression algorithm on top of it. Okay, so let me call it data set 1, data set 1, data set 2, data set 3. I'll write it in a different color. Data set 1, data set 2, data set 3. Uh, you parse it through the regression algorithm whatever regression algorithm you have, you've studied a lot of such algorithms by now, and you will get f hat 1, f hat 2, f hat 3, and so on, right? So now you have a lot of different uh, versions of f hat, and now you can study the statistical properties of, the, uh, uh, of this regression algorithm. So if you have a data set, and each of these f hats turns out to be very close to each other in some norm, then you know that the regression algorithm you have picked is actually very good. On the other hand, um, if these f hats tend, turns out to be very far apart, then it means that there is a very high variance associated with the regression algorithm you have picked, and you should perhaps use some other regression algorithm. So let's say you are using RKHS training and you get a very large spread among these f hats, then it means that RKHS is not the right uh, framework or that particular kernel is not the right framework to pick for fitting this data set and you perhaps want to uh, choose a different kernel within RKHS framework or uh, maybe move to some other regression algorithm like k-nearest neighbor or some non-parametric function approximator, okay? so. That's the essential idea of why you do bootstrapping. So this whole process is known as bootstrapping. And it allows you to study the statistical properties of uh, uh, the regression algorithm. On a data set. All right, so that's the idea of bootstrapping. However, now what you can do is you can aggregate these functions. Okay, so uh, so that's the second part, which is bootstrap aggregation. So this is, we've talked about bootstrapping. So bootstrapping, so you have data set, you feed it to you feed it to bootstrapping algorithm, and you get a bunch of f at 1 to f at let's say capital M, okay? So you got like M different random functions. Now bootstrap aggregation says, well, what we should do is define my F hat of X to be 1 over capital M, not 1 over capital M, summation, summation of uh, weights. So let me denote weights by theta. 
i equals 1 no not i let me use j equals 1 to capital m theta j f hat j x okay so you got like all these set of functions uh, and now you just want to take the convex some combination of these functions and you compute theta star using minimize theta in R capital M of summation Z I minus uh, summation theta J F hat J X I J equals 1 to M I equals 1 to small m okay so by solving this uh, minimization problem you can find the optimal weights theta um, and use that theta as the function approximator so your f hat x would become j equals 1 to capital m theta j star f hat j x so uh, so this is known as this whole idea is known as bagging so bagging stands for bootstrap aggregation so they just uh, created a, uh, a shorter form which is called bagging so bagging is let me go over it once again what the overall idea of bagging is so in bagging you split you have a data set you sample the data set into smaller data sets and you create various uh, using the regression algorithm you create the functions f hat 1 to f hat m um, and then you want to come up with optimal weights thetas so that uh, your f hat x can be written as a linear combination of these f hat j's that you have received from the bootstrapping algorithm so how do you compute these th weights theta j well you can uh, run a quadratic optimization problem so remember this is a quadratic optimization problem in theta j so you can run this algorithm in order to compute the f hat x which is your final regression function this is your final regression function okay um, in in practice this uh, idea has performed much much better than trying to just use this original idea which is you have a data set you feed it into a regression algorithm and you get an f hat and that f hat is your function approximator so this idea is one strong learner because it uses the entire data set. Um, these are M weak learners because you're not using the entire data set using a subset of the data in order to compute these uh, functions F hat 1 to F hat M. Okay, so this and this is a committee. This is a committee of weak learners. So the reason why they are weak is because they are using a subset of the data and not the entire data set. Okay, so a committee of weak learners outperformed a dictator and the dictator here is, is or, or a strong learner and the strong learner here is the original regression function. So very simple idea and has uh, made remarkable uh, and, and has uh, turned out to be a remarkable idea if you want to do a regression, a good regression. Okay, so another idea which is uh, similar to this idea is known as boosting. Okay, so what's the key idea in boosting? So in bagging, the idea was that you create the original function f at x as a summation of theta j f hat j x where you compute f hat j using some um, using some uh, uh, regression algorithm and using a subset of the data now in boosting uh, one can view it as two ways one is in the bagging case you had picked uh, the data su sub the subset of the data in order to compute each of these f hat j you used the uh, iid sampling technique to come up with the data subset uh, whereas in boosting you would uh, pick data that appears rarely you will try to pick them more often and data that appears uh, 
very often you will give them less weightage okay so instead of picking data according to an iid fashion you are picking data which is not necessarily um, uh, you are you are trying to create data subsets uh, which are not necessarily uh, according to an iid distribution from the original data set okay so that's one way to understand boosting but there is another way to understand boosting which is uh, i just postulate that my regression function has the form f at x uh, which i'm going to write as a function of theta as well so i'm not going to continue writing theta everywhere because of the notational clutter so i'm just going to refer it to as f at x but f at x depends on the parameters theta as summation beta j phi x theta j where phi are the basis functions oh, sorry not theta j uh, gamma j j equals 1 to m where theta equals to beta 1 gamma 1 beta 2 gamma 2 beta capital M gamma capital M okay so this is uh, so I'm postulating that my f hat x forms uh, is of this particular form and now I want to minimize with respect to theta uh, summation of zi minus well let me pick a general loss function zi comma f hat xi theta i equals 1 to small m okay 1 over m and typically of course this loss would be a quadratic loss function but you can pick some other loss function as well so typically l of z comma z prime could be z prime minus z square or z minus z prime square okay so uh, so how do you compute this uh, minimum over theta where theta has this particular structure so beta 1 gamma 1 beta 2 gamma 2 and beta m gamma m well, it seems like this has some separability structure, so we could potentially use uh, um, uh, separable. Uh, so we could use we could simplify the optimization problem in a way that makes computation of these beta i's and gamma i's uh, or beta j's and gamma j's easier. So, uh, so how do you do it? Well, this is one algorithm which is known as uh, Uh, which is known as forward stage-wise additive modeling. Forward stage-wise additive modeling. This is the algorithm. And here you start with f not x equal to 0, f hat 0 x equal to 0. And then you compute beta j gamma j star as argmin beta j gamma j of summation i equals 1 to m 1 over m l of z i and f hat j minus 1 x i plus beta phi x beta j phi x gamma j okay so this is my optimization problem i'm optimizing with respect to beta j and gamma j in order to get beta j star and gamma j star and then i'm going to set f hat j of x as f hat j minus 1 x plus beta j star phi 
x gamma j star gamma j star okay so this is my uh, no uh, I shouldn't write it as f hat j so this is f hat j is the previous f hat j minus 1 plus beta j star phi um, beta j star which you found here and then gamma j star which you also found as part of this optimization and then once you set this then you go back to this with the new index j equals to j plus 1 and then you move on to compute beta j plus 1 and gamma j plus 1 okay so so it basically tries to compute the value of theta star in a sequential fashion and not necessarily as a big optimization problem so this is the big optimization problem and uh, instead of solving this big problem at once we try to solve small problems in order to get a lot of weak learners so these are the weak learners okay so a committee of weak learners is better than uh, a dictator okay so this is the idea of uh, boosting so one way to think of boosting is so there are there, so there is a there is a technical way of uh, viewing boosting as a gradient descent in the function space uh, so that's what i'm going to talk about next but uh, at this point of time i'm going to pause for like a couple of seconds to for you to review this idea and see how it uh, how it's related to the idea of bagging Okay, so one thing that I want to talk about now is uh, what are these functions phi and what are these gamma j's? So if your phi was neural network, then gamma j is the weight matrices, matrices. If phi was a regression tree, then gamma j was the uh, index index uh, uh, the threshold and the value. So remember, c greater than zero and c less than or equal to zero. Okay. So we talked about it in the uh, in the regression tree. Uh, algorithm. Uh, if phi was a, a function, what other function? So if phi was RKHS, then gamma j would be the xi itself. So gamma j would be equal to xi itself. Okay. So there are many different. Uh, 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 so in every algorithm gamma j's have different values uh, or different uh, uh, so, uh, but but once you once you pick a regression problem you would easily figure out what what are the parameterization in that regression problem and that's what that's the information that is contained within gamma j whereas beta j is merely the weight that you get that gets added to the uh, function phi at the end Okay, so you, you can view boosting as a functional gradient descent. Uh, so what is a functional gradient descent? So you can, let's say your zi is truly a function of f of xi. So f is the true function. This is the true relationship. And we are in a sitting in a function space f, which is the class of regression function that we are considering. 
and and we would like to identify want to identify a fact in the class f such that the summation of l of f xi f at xi i equals 1 to m 1 over m is minimized okay this is what our problem is so let me call this objective function as j of f okay so j of f hat sorry okay and we want to minimize over all possible f hat in the class f with the uh, uh, with the objective function being j of f hat so we could run a gradient descent in the function space okay so the finite additive forward stage wise additive modeling that we talked about in the previous uh, slide or previous uh, notebook um, is essentially a gradient descent running a gradient descent of this particular uh, function so the gradient descent algorithm here would be f hat j plus 1 equals to f hat j plus beta j gradient of f hat f hat j okay so this is the gradient descent where beta j is actually argmin beta greater than 0 j of f hat j plus b not beta greater than 0 i'll put beta in r f hat j plus beta gradient of f hat j of f hat j okay so so this is this is the form of gradient descent algorithm and this is what uh, this is how you pick the the minimizing beta j but of course in this case one of the problems that we face is that the gradient of this gradient so the problem is that the gradient gradient f hat j of f hat f hat j may not belong to the function space capital f that we are considering okay so so that's a problem but it's it's not really a big issue because what you can do is you can again try to project this particular gradient onto the function space function class capital f that you have um, and that's why you get uh, and and so what you do is essentially the gradient descent the actual gradient descent you run is f hat j plus 1 equals to f hat j plus beta j and uh, some phi of x comma gamma j okay where beta j sorry where beta j and gamma j is uh, obtained through the forward stage wise additive modeling um, algorithm so the this was beta j star and gamma j star in that particular algorithm and so it's essentially trying to what it's what this algorithm for this this forward stage wise additive modeling is trying to do is instead of looking at the actual derivative which will be the correct thing to do if you were running a true gradient descent you instead project the gradient project the gradient onto the function space by picking an appropriate value of beta j star and gamma j star okay so uh, so boosting is basically trying to uh, iteratively compute a good approximation to the true regression function and as once again it's a sum of weak learners and this has uh, uh, outperformed the the strong learner uh, regression algorithms uh, by a good by a good margin and that's why people have studied boosting for a long time in machine learning 
although the idea is sort of pretty new i think the idea arose around 97 98 uh, even though there were bits of it in the literature earlier than 98 99 but that's when it got formalized into uh, uh, into the current form that we are studying in this particular class so so far what we have studied is uh, bootstrapping and boosting uh, sorry bootstrap aggregation and boost boosting and in bootstrap aggregation all the data points were considered um, uh, with iid uh, in order to compute each of these weak learners whereas now uh, the data points that are not able to fit well into the function approximator is considered more often and the data points that fit within the function approximating class they are considered less often in uh, this in the boosting case so in some sense boosting is better than uh, bagging although um, uh, although the there are situations where bagging appears to be better than boosting and there are situations where boosting appears to be better than bagging so there is no clear winner uh, as far as applications are concerned but naturally boosting is a slight generalization of uh, the idea of bagging okay so now uh, uh, now let's look at uh, the boosting the forward stage wise so i'm going to go back one slide so let's look at the forward stage wise uh, additive modeling again so in this problem the idea was to do the minimization over beta j and gamma j of this particular loss function okay so beta j is an r it's a real number whereas gamma j could be a, a very complicated uh, uh, matrix or could be a complicated uh, vector a very high dimensional vector so how can we minimize the computational time of this particular algorithm so that's the idea in random kitchen sink which was proposed in a series of papers by Rahimi and Recht in 2008 2009 and the idea here is as follows so again now they are using different uh, notation so uh, the theta here is the same as gamma in the previous slide so this is phi of x comma gamma this is gamma this is probability distribution over gamma and this is the rkhs kernel that they are talking about so m m inspired by the rkhs kernel uh, they come up with some probability distribution over gamma and then the idea is you pick gamma 1 to gamma m iid according to this distribution p of theta and p not theta p of gamma p of gamma and uh, um, and you define your function f hat of x as summation of beta j uh, phi of x gamma j j equals 1 to capital m the only thing is in the previous case in the case of boosting or bagging you would pick m say equals to 50 or 100 whereas in the case of a random basis function so now this basis function is random because gammas are all random so this is a random basis function and um, uh, this is a random basis function so these functions are uh, this this phi is basically random because gamma j's are random and this is sum of random basis function so that's why it's called random kitchen sink uh, i don't know where the kitchen sink came from but uh, that's what it's called uh, okay but now here the m is of the order of 10 raised to 4 or 10 raised to 5 okay so now the number of random functions that you have to pick is very 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 large okay in comparison to what you would otherwise do in boosting or bagging okay so for different for three different uh, uh, basis functions phi so one is cos function the other one is sine um, you know shifted sine function which is called a stump and then uh, and and some other function called bins 
so what are the what's the main theorem that we get uh, uh, for this particular what's the kind of result we get for this uh, class of randomized function approximators p is distribution so p is distribution over gamma p satisfies p of x gamma infinity so in this is infinity norm over both x and gamma is less than equal to 1 uh, c is a constant such that some weight vector alpha w is less than equal to alpha gamma is less than equal to c p gamma and you define the function class fp as fx which is given by integral of alpha gamma p x gamma d gamma and this is over all over all of gamma so uh, this integral is over gamma of course uh, right so and alpha of gamma satisfies this particular condition so c is a constant such that alpha gamma is less than equal to cp gamma so fp is the function class and so if you're trying to find a regression function within this class uh, then with so given given epsilon greater than zero given delta greater than zero there exist capital m such that or capital m bar uh, such that the j of f hat minus min of f hat in capital fp j of f hat so this let me call it f hat m because this is the uh, this is the f hat m uh, that you defined here uh, with respect to the best possible f hat you can find in this particular function class fp is less than equal to epsilon with probability 1 minus 2 delta okay so uh, the actual result is available you can go and look at the actual result in this uh, series of papers by rahmi and rec okay but uh, the idea here the essential idea here is that instead of trying to optimize over all possible gamma j's in in the finite stage wise additive modeling uh, algorithm you just pick gamma j's randomly but a very large number of gamma j's um, uh, in order to and then you try to just find the optimal beta j star so that that's a very simple optimization problem because you can uh, literally pick uh, uh, because that's just a linear regression problem in one dimension okay if your loss function was quadratic then it's a linear regression problem in one dimension so uh, very simple uh, to uh, simple to solve this problem uh, this particular result is a bit more complicated so i'm not writing down all the details of this algorithm uh, that's there in the that's there in the original paper but i wanted to show you what are the key assumptions that they have made uh, on the function approximating class fp so that uh, the random basis function idea uh, gives you a very good result uh, with very high probability okay so that's the that's called random kitchen sinks again a very good uh, function approximator but only with high probability okay now the next idea is a random forest idea which is basically a combination of bagging plus random sampling of features so remember in the bagging algorithm you had to pick a smaller data set 
So you, you have a larger data set, you pick the smaller data set out of that larger data set, and then you try to construct a decision tree out of it. Okay, so within a decision tree, you have to pick what should this um, coordinate be, what should this threshold be, T2, and what should the values of R1 and R2 be, right? And there was a very complicated algorithm, which is basically this uh, set of algorithm in order to compute the value of J star, X bar J, and then C, which is basically going to go here. So this is R2 is this one, R1 is this one, X2 is the optimal J here, and T2 is the optimal X bar J here. Okay, so this is a very complicated problem. So especially if you have very large number of data. So if you want to create a regression tree with, let's say, 1 million data set, 1 million data points, um, computing this will take eternity. So you don't want to do that much work. So what you instead do is uh, uh, pick a small subset of the data and you create, uh, you pick a random set of uh, coordinates. Of course, X bar J remains the same as it was in the original uh, problem and then you try to minimize the same objective function. So now your set of coordinates has become small. So that simplifies the optimization problem and the number of data you are considering in the random forest, uh, sorry, in the uh, in computing one of the decision tree is also very small. So therefore it's easy to calculate. easy to calculate and um, you come up with different data subsets and come up with different uh, coordinates to solve this problem and then you get a large number of regression functions f hat 1 to f hat m so this sort of algorithm will yield so you do bootstrapping Then you apply this particular algorithm, you get f hat 1 to f hat m. So assuming you have m possible data subsets, then you get f hat 1 to f hat m. So now you have a large number of decision trees or regression trees. Okay. Um, and then you add, of course, beta 1, beta 2 beta capital M and this F hat M and what you get is a random forest. So a collection of trees is a forest so that's why it's a forest and by random what we mean is both when you're doing bootstrapping you're doing random you are introducing randomness and when you're selecting these uh, these coordinates then also you are introducing randomness among these trees. Uh, so that's why it's called uh, random forest. So that's another random function approximator which uh, people have used in the past for regression. Now, uh, so so far we have talked about regression, which is trying to fit x i and z i i equals one to m. Uh, you want to pass it through some regression algorithm. So now we have talked about parametric regression, non-parametric regression, and randomized regression. And then you get a function f hat, which sort of fits the data pretty well, okay, with very little error. Now, in reinforcement learning, typically xi's would consist of state and action pairs, or just the state uh, values of the state. Zi's would consist, con contain the value functions or q value functions that you would want to assign to those state action pairs or states. Okay, and you want to pass it through some regression algorithm in order to compute f hat. Uh, sorry, in order to compute either v hat, which is the value function or an estimate of the value function, or q hat, which is an estimate of the q function. Now, that's not the only uh, thing you can potentially estimate. So you can also estimate the transition probability, which is p of s prime given s a. So given the data, you would want to estimate this transition probability. So this is one of the uh, ways to estimate the transition probability, which is for every state action pair or for not, I shouldn't say every because you could be in an uncountable state, but 
for many state action pairs let's say you have m samples iid samples of the state then you can define your transition probability kernel as as a summation of gaussian kernels where h is the bandwidth remember we talked about it in the context of nadaraya watson kernel estimator so h is the bandwidth so you can consider it as an average of the gaussian kernels um, where i equals 1 to m m is remember m is the number of iid samples you have and this is an approximation to the original transition probability okay where n is so in this case n is the normalization constant in order to make it a probability distribution so that's one way to come up with uh, an estimator for p hat m uh, you do it for various uh, state action pairs and then you try to come up with the transition kernel for the entire space so that sort of uh, that class of algorithm is very very complicated so instead remember that we use p of s prime given s a only to compute the expected value uh, sorry expected uh, future value given the current state and action okay so so this is this is one possibility but it's not a very good possibility because um, you can't really come up with a probability distribution, conditional probability distribution for every state action pairs. So you would want to instead look at a trajectory, right? You are given a trajectory and then you would somehow want to estimate the value of, um, estimate of the value function given the current state action pair. Okay, so this is, this is what Fed feeds into the Bellman operator. Okay, so how do you do that? Well, you apply the same Nadaraya Watson kernel estimator idea. Now, of course, this is the idea that I have picked from this particular paper, which is published in, I think, 2001, NeurIPS. It's a 2001 NeurIPS paper. Uh, but, uh, uh, but you could potentially use uh, some other kernel, some other estimators as well. This is not the only possibility. But the idea is um, you have the value function v, you evaluate it at st plus 1. This is the indicator function. So 1 of at equals to a is equals to 1 if at was equal to a and 0 if at is not equal to a. Okay, And then you, um, you try to estimate the expected value if this... Uh, using this expression okay and then you can use it to minimize over all possible actions oh i have to mention that in this case the action space is finite okay all right so so this is uh, one way to compute uh, the bellman operator the sorry the inner part of the bellman operator and then you can do the minimization over all actions a in order to find the most suitable action and then update the value function v hat um, suitably using some sort of regression algorithm and then you recompute based on the simulated trajectory you can recompute what the uh, what the value function should look like so this concludes our discussion on the regression regression algorithms which is intricately used in every step of reinforcement learning so let me recall the idea you have state action so st at or some sort of trajectory you feed it into regression algorithm to compute your v hat v hat or q hat functions and then you feed it into your reinforcement learning algorithm which typically would would have two components so this reinforcement learning algorithm will have exploration versus exploitation and uh, the Bellman operation. So once you feed it into the RL algorithm and then you put it in the simulator or some sort of data collection simulator 
or some other way of collecting the data and then you close the loop okay so that's the so so what we have done in the last week and in this week is we have tried and understood uh, what are the different options we have within the regression part um, in the case of multi arm bandit we have explored uh, we have understood how exploration and exploitation trade off is usually done and we have studied a variety of algorithms and of course bellman operator is something that that we know by heart by now because we have used it a lot of times so so now this particular figure everything has come together in order to explain what reinforcement learning is all about so reinforcement learning is about coming up with an appropriate uh, function approximating class okay and the corresponding regression algorithm so this function approximating class can give you v hat q hat it can also give you mu hat which is the policy wait i think uh, you may not do regression here but you will do you will get mu hat which is the policy updated policy here and that goes into the simulator and then the simulator generates the new trajectory after which you do the regression and <coughs> and uh, uh, this cycle completes so so one of the things you will notice uh, is uh, is that what happens when you have high dimensional spaces okay so this thing is something we haven't yet touched upon yet uh, so if you have a uh, state space s which is a subset of r2 versus if you have a state space s as a subset of r10 or subset of r20 so r2 is very simple if you have a vehicle with two coordinates then you will have a state space of r2 on the other hand if you have uh, a vehicle an actual vehicle running on the road then you could have a state space that is of the order of r10 and if you are doing some very complex geometric uh, configuration of 3d models then your state space could easily blow up to r20 or even much higher dimensional okay so if your state space is so large uh, the question naturally arises is what kind of regression what's the problem with the regression algorithm so let's say you have data points x1 to x n <coughs> which is part of the state space s now how many data points do you need to be close to any point when the within the state space so the question is how many data points so this is n you need so that so that uh, the data point is close to every other point in the space capital s okay so this is uh, usually captured by this uh, particular expression so you have xi um, in the uh, which you have uh, which you have generated through the simulation or through some iid process or um, the states that you have visited in the trajectory okay and x is any point within the state space s so this x is in the state space s and you want to find the expected value of the minimum distance with respect to any other point so let's say you have you've put the a uniform distribution over the state space capital s and you have picked uh, n iid points from the state space capital s so what's the expected value of this minimum this is d infinity dn and there is a very good lower bound on this and so this table summarizes everything so if you are in one dimension and you have 100 data points you are extremely close to every other point so you want your d infinity to be as small as possible 
So even with 100 data points, you are very close to all other points within the uh, set. When you have 10 dimensional state space, uh, with 100 data points, 100 uniformly distributed data points, you have you are at least 0 0.28 away from the points. And, and when you have 20 dimensional space, then the distance becomes much larger. Okay. I think the here the state space for computing this lower bound the state space s is 0 1 raised to d raised to d yeah so this is the d this is the dimension <clears throat> okay uh, and so if you are if you are if you are in 20 dimensional state space uh, and even if you have 100,000 data points, you are still very far away from all the points in the space in expectation. This is known as the curse of dimensionality. So as your dimension increases, you, your requirements on the number of data points you need increases uh, significantly. Okay, and that's why you want to make sure that you have, if you have high dimensional state space, you want to have very, very high number of samples in order to be able to make a good uh, in order to be able to estimate the value functions correctly in the reinforcement learning problem and in order to get a very good results uh, out of your um, uh, reinforcement learning out of the learned policy through reinforcement learning so let's conclude the topic of regression once more um, the idea in regression was you have a function class f and you want to make sure that <clears throat> you can approximate any other function in the class L, which is the space of measurable function. <clears throat> so you want to be able to approximate uh, using the uh, class of functions F, you want to be able to approximate any function F in L. Okay, so if you use very few parameters, so your dimension of theta is small, then, then you can think of your f as small line. So these black lines are f, are functions in f, whereas the white space is basically the entire space L. <clears throat> so if you pick a function, a measurable function then uh, and, and you try to come up with the best possible function f hat in capital f then you will have some sort of error which you will have to live with on the other hand if you pick dimension of theta large as you can see you can get close to any function in the space of measurable function right so so you will always tempted to keep a, take a very high dimensional um, parameterization of the space so that you can get close to any function you want in the space of measurable function. So this was the idea in parametric and non-parametric regression. Okay, in the random regression idea, the idea was you pick some random functions f1, f2, f3 and this is the function v that you want to optimize. So what you do is you take a linear combination of these functions. Okay, so the linear combination might be here <coughs> and then you can approximate the function v very easily. Okay, uh, on the other hand if your function class is very very rich okay and you pick a very large number of well this blue is not looking good let me use red so you pick a very large number of random functions within the space and then you take a linear combination of this function and this is the point that you want to you want to get at you will perhaps be able to uh, get as close to it as possible by picking an appropriate weights for uh, this particular <clears throat> for the basis functions that you have generated okay so this is uh, again dimension of theta is small dimension of theta is large 
and you can approximate any function v with very high probability when you have high dimensional theta and you're using random functions a large number of random functions okay so uh, that's the overall idea concluding thoughts for this uh, regression problem and now from the next class onwards we are going to go back to reinforcement learning and we're going to study uh, different classes of reinforcement learning algorithms that essentially has these uh, these three ideas which is regression so what kind of regression function you pick uh, what kind of exploration exploitation scheme you pick and um, and how do you do the regression and how do you what sort of error bounds can you get for the overall reinforcement learning problem so thank you and see you in the next class